Welcome to the UK, to many of you and to some of you who also live here, welcome back. Um, lovely to see you, thank you so much for coming out to this exclusive, exclusive Q&A for Ender's Game. Uh, many of these people have been tweeting their questions as well and they've got some great stuff to ask you, so let's get straight to it. Um, first of all, Stefan Jones uh, is the first one. He said, Ender's Game was published nearly 30 years ago, why has it taken so long? to become a massive motion picture. I guess we should probably aim that maybe towards to Bob, uh, Bob and Gigi. Why did it take you so long to get the rights to the book, Gigi? <laughs> what happened? I had a, a nephew who read the book a long time ago and loved it. And this is a boy who had a hard time reading. So the fact that he read a book was shocking to me. Uh, and I decided I need to read it as well. Um, and it was a terrific book. He was right. And it took me 13 years to find Bob. <laughs> and you know the technology didn't fully exist. You know the the effects had to be great and had to be wonderful, and and audiences needed to be hungry for it. They've seen so many things that we've already seen, and so this book is is though written in '84, very original, and hopefully uh, audiences will will be satisfied by the fact that it's not something they've seen before. Um, let me ask maybe you, Gavin, then, because of course talking about the advancements of CG. Was it something that couldn't have been made many years ago? Is now the right time to make this movie? I'm, I'm hesitant in the presence of Harrison Ford to say that something to do with science fiction couldn't be made. <laughs> <laughs> and he's spoken very eloquently on the way that the, um, the battleships were made in Star Wars and made as models using actually steel his thunder. But he'll tell you all about that. But, but, you know, so the point is that technology is, is something that... What's happened is that we've reached a point now where visual effects really are so good that they can either be well used or abused. You can, you can slam visual effects all over a movie and, and, and audience go, that's really cool, is there a story in here anywhere? Um, so what I love about Ender's Game is that it does have fantastic visual effects. Bob's absolutely right, we now can render the battle room which fans love in this beautiful photorealistic way. Um, but it's, it's also a story that its heart is about great characters and great character interaction. So I hope you guys get two things. I hope you get fantastic visuals, and I hope that you still have the themes and ideas and challenges that the book is in, in, in the movie that we all love. Um, Harrison, then, turning to you then, obviously a man that's worked in this genre for, for many years, if you've seen CGI grow and change, what were the fundamental differences that you saw working now on Ender's Game that maybe you didn't see back in in the late 70s and early 80s? Well, in the olden days, <laughs> and I was there, we had sort of horse-drawn effects. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you put bits together, and then you made a physical prop, and you photographed it. Now you can create it in, the, in a computer. And that's basically the difference. But, uh, you know, and both methods uh, work. Um, the computer graphic is uh, is uh, perhaps allows you a little bit more latitude, but it also allows you the potential, as, as Gavin mentioned, to 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 exceed human scale, uh, to get beyond uh, you know overpopulate the screen uh, in a way that confuses the eye and the emotions, and, I, and I'm convinced by what I've seen that, that we have not done that here. But it's a great aid to imagination, and one of the best things about science fiction, I think, is that it, 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 it um, uh, the bandwidth of imagination that you can, that you can uh, uh, use. I mean, realistic film on Earth only has a certain visual and, and uh, um, has an, a certain potential. But when you get into the future, uh, it broadens. You can imagine things that... Uh, and this book did imagine, 28 years ago, things like the internet, touch screen technology, um, uh, drone warfare, all of which 
which is now a part of our lives, for better or worse. Um, so it's a, it's a very, uh, there's a lot of wisdom and, uh, and uh, understanding in the book. And, uh, potentially, we've captured quite a bit of it. Thank you, I hope so. How was it for you, Asa and Haley, then, working with this, I mean, first venture into the world of sci-fi for you guys as well? What was it like working, I mean, obviously you had some physical, physical problems, but working with the world of CGI as well? It was really exciting. Neither of us had done a film with this level of special effects and this level of CGI, and when you're hanging there in 20 feet off the ground, surrounded by green screen, and all you've got is the other actor, a metal star and the wonderful Gavin Hood shouting instructions at you as to what's going on. It's it's a really interesting experience and we honestly couldn't do it without all of those instructions being shouted out and we had a lot of fun <coughs> experiencing and Gavin had his what we could breathe is, which is what his idea was, that's what the film would look like, but nothing can compare to the final image. Um, let me talk about the book for a second as well. Rich Jenkins and so many people on Twitter want to know about this. Like, how familiar were you all with the book? Because uh, we know that in, in America, this is this is part of your curriculum now at school. People read this book, but over here in the UK, it wasn't so known. Although this room knows it very well, right? Yeah, these guys, these guys love it. So, I mean, how aware were you growing up with this book? Have you started with you? I'm, I'm excited to read it. It sounds great. <laughs> I've seen the film. Just watch the movie. It's amazing. I read it in seventh grade when I was twelve years old, and I loved it. Uh, it didn't talk down to me. I loved it. It celebrated intelligence. I loved it. It had complicated themes. I loved it. It was a, you know, a huge adventure and a great space adventure. So it, it kind of hit all the sweet spots for a twelve-year-old. I read it as an adult, and I loved that a thirteen-year-old boy and his aunt could sit and talk about those themes and those issues and dig into something. And, the fact that a book could inspire conversation among generations was terrific to me. Were you aware of it, Sir I wasn't, I wasn't aware of it at all until I met Gavin. He came to meet me at the Four Seasons Hotel. And he had this wonderful um, laptop with him and showed me all the beautiful graphics, talked me through what he, um, what he intended for the film. And I realized I wasn't looking at the graphics. I was hardly listening to what he was saying. I just thought, this is a really unique guy. He's strong, he's passionate, he's, he's a great leader, uh, and he has a very broad intelligence and imagination. So his map of the book is what I took as my map of the character and, and, and the world that we inhabited. I know that Gavin struggled to adapt the book to the screen because the novel, by, by definition, is an internal process. And what we have to do here is massively externalize what's going on in people's minds and imaginations and what they're struggling with. So my first impression of it, and my lasting impression, will be Gavin's interpretation of this clearly wonderful book. Um, what about for you, Asa? Did you ever read it, or you, did you get the script and then go back to the book? How was it for you? Yeah, I, I read it just after I got the script, and I'm a massive fan of science fiction, so it was, it was right on my street, and I loved it as much as I loved the story, and uh, for me, not just the character of Ender, but the whole world is so beautifully crafted in the novel that I, I, I wasn't sure how it could be brought to the screen, but Gavin has done it justice and he's done it amazingly. Um, one thing I was going to ask you though, Gavin, is when you're uh, adapting a book, when you're adapting a screenplay, and like Savin says, it, it's a book about what's going on internally. And you're writing this, do you not think, I know, you can write this, but can you direct it? <laughs> I'll just change that bit. This will be easier. First of all, let me say thank you to my fantastic cast for their kind words. Um, because they, you, know, you don't make a film on your own. And um, I'm hugely supported by their talents and the talents of people who are not here, great visual effects supervisors and so on. So it's a little embarrassing, but thank you so much. And, and we had a fantastic time, as you can tell. And, um, this, this wonderful family has, has, I hope, delivered something that all you fans will like. But yes, in terms of adapting the book to the screen, um, <laughs> It is a very internal journey, but it also is a fantastic sort of spectacle. The, the battle room, which is just beautiful visually to, 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 to create and think about the final simulation battle. Um, they were challenging those environments because, you know, when you're sitting there in the book, if you read the book, you, you know that, I hope this doesn't come across the wrong way, but it is a black box room. 
and it reads brilliantly and all the battles brilliant. And suddenly I've taken on this job and I was all keen and I got there and oh boy. Now I have to actually decide well, what is it going to look like? If it's a black box, why am I up in space? So you, you know, inspiration comes from crazy places, but I, I remember thinking, okay, it was a huge glass sphere. I hope you guys will forgive me and embrace this because here's the thinking. I'm in space, I need a huge glass sphere so when you jump out, you really feel like you're in space. You look up and the sun's there, and the earth's down below, and, and I took this idea to Gigi and Bob, and I was all enthusiastic, and, and they go, budget, budget, budget. <laughs> How are we gonna do this? But they immediately jumped on board, and we developed it with fantastic concept artists, the wonderful production designers, Ben Proctor and, and Sean Harworth, they just built this thing up, and then took it out into the world as a 45 second teaser piece, the battle room was the first thing we developed, and took it to camp, and you know, it wasn't made with big studio money. The big studios, as you know, were, I don't know, afraid to make this film for many years. Tried, gave up. And so we had to raise the money from places like England and France and Germany and all over the world. So, um... I sold my house. I beg your pardon? I sold my house. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it, it, it was a, a great, great opportunity to get an international group of people. That's my cue to show. He has, he has such a lovely house. Uh, <laughs> Hayley and, and, and Asa, let me talk more about, about your characters, because they're at the real heart of this. And, and we talked a lot about the CGI, and, 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 the, and we'll talk more about the physical elements in a moment. But it's your relationships um, and the journey that you go through. For those people that, that, that don't know the movie, obviously, it's out on the 25th. Um, talk about the character relationships that you guys have. My character, Petra, you meet her at a time where uh, you know that she's been in the ballet school for quite a while. And when you meet Ender, he's instantly shut down. And he's instantly doubted by everybody else in the ballet school because you look at somebody at that point as, how are they going to catch up with us? How are they going to, how is he nearly going to be as good as us? We've been here forever. We've worked so hard. Especially when he's coming in and our mentors are already telling us that he's the best of the best. And you could assume that my character being one of very few girls in the battle school and being the only girl in the Salamander army uh, got quite a bit of that sort of um, doubt in her too, I think, from other people around her. So when they meet each other, they're really not looking for anything but a friend. Um, they're placed into this world where they don't know who they can trust and who they can't trust, or, you know, they don't really have, they don't really have any anybody to sort of look to. So when they meet each other, they, they find that within each other. And I think it's a really special, a really special friendship. Were you both aware, obviously, when you, you, you read the, the, the screenplay, for example, when you got the script, were you aware of not only how deep the characters are, because they are very layered characters, and then you've got the action on top of that. Were you like, hang on, this is a movie in itself of just character. You've got so much more. Was that scary? Was that frightening? Or was that a challenge? For me, that was one of the really intriguing parts of the story. Yes, it's this epic science fiction adventure, and then when you look into it and you get the underlying layers, it becomes so much more than that. I don't think many films today have that sort of feeling behind it. And as you said, with the ballroom scenes and keeping all of those ideas intact, it was it was a challenge, and I think keeping it all together and keeping it loyal to the book and keeping all of those ideas about leadership and friendship and choices and the internal struggles between people and inside themselves. It's, um, it's a really, really interesting idea. Let's talk about your relationship with Harrison's character, kind of graph. It's quite, it's quite fraught. It's quite, um, Harrison's in the room. This is really tough. He's quite, he's quite hard-edged, he's quite pushy. Um, how did you keep that relationship on screen, and did you keep that relationship off screen, so that the on screen stuff worked? Uh, I'm so glad you're sitting next to him and I'm not with that question. That's an egg thing. <laughs> perfectly well what was going on. We both had uh, responsibilities to the telling of the story and uh, the, the character that I play is both manipulator and mentor and, uh, uh, and is very 
precariously understood and, and um, uh, seen through Andrew's eyes as an obstacle, as, uh, as um, uh, you know, strict instructor. Um, but the character I play is, you know, I, I, when I play a character, I'm not interested in deciding for myself whether he's a good guy or a bad guy. He's a person, a character that's charged with a certain responsibility, both, uh, you know, the, the fictional responsibility, but also responsible um, for, for playing the part. And, um, uh, you know, we had a very uh, good casual understanding of, uh, of each other, and, uh, uh, but it was a distance uh, between uh, us that um, Gavin and I talked about. Um, and Gavin had a, um, a very clear idea of, um, of what he wanted to do, put all the kids through a kind of boot camp, space camp. There were drill instructors on, on the set to, to uh, to teach them marching and cadence and all of the military uh, uh, behaviors that they needed to, uh, to replicate on screen. And um, uh, I think Asa well understood that I was there uh, uh, purposefully uh, uh, holding myself slightly uh, away. Distraction, but an aid uh, to the storytelling obligations that we both had. Hey, so what was that like the first day you walk in and you have a scene, presumably with, with Harrison, and obviously you've worked with Sabet before. What was that? What was that moment? Moment like? Um, I think well, the first scene was back on Earth, but I seem to remember my first time meeting Harrison was it was at the read through in New Orleans all those many, many months ago, and I, I, when I grew up, I, of course, had a, watched the Star Wars saga and Indiana Jones, and I was very excited to meet Mr. Ford, and um, <laughs> <laughs> That's just the room. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have a question from uh, Sammy Rodden uh, sent us this question. It says, it's for Gavin, uh, Bob, and Gigi. Uh, what drew you into hiring Asa and Haley? What was it about these guys that were right to be the leads in this movie? Well, um, Haley has done phenomenal work as an Academy Award nominated actress. And uh, I tell you what was interesting when I, when I was. You, you don't really know this, right? I'm looking at True Grit, and I'll tell you the truth I said to him. My worry here is that this is a very restrained character. And Petra is so much, you remember, so much more charismatic. And I went to him quietly to Mars and I Googled you, Googled it. And I Googled interviews. And here in these interviews comes alive this bubbly, warm, oh my God, she did some real acting in True Grits. I mean, she had to restrain herself and be this very intense young lady. And she, her natural personality is so warm and so, oh wow, this is going to be good. So, your, your best audition was whatever you did on some interview. I think you were in a red dress. Go find that. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe it was a red dress. Anyway, oh, hey, Google it. She was just so fabulous in this interview. And I can't remember. Just, and I thought, okay, she really can do this. And then, of course, you know, um, Ace's, Ace's work is fantastic. in the striped pajamas and so on. But, but uh, and he was working with Sir Ben on, on Hugo. And I spoke, I spoke to Martin Scorsese. And he spoke very highly of you. We do our little background checks. But he did, he did send me... Um, a fantastic audition tape from London. And at that stage, we were auditioning a lot of actors, a lot of actors. And as you guys know, the story takes place in the book. He's six years old, and then he's 13 by the end. And I decided, and I hope you go with me, that we needed to compress this into a year so I wasn't changing actors. So I'm, but I started off looking at young, seven, eight, nine, ten, oh my goodness. And let me tell you, we had some talented little eight-year-olds. But when that talented little eight-year-old came up against Colonel Graf, not Harrison in the room, but me trying to do a bad impersonation. And he's going, I don't want you to do I don't this to you all. This is just horrible. I mean, really horrible. I said, oh, we don't have a movie. We just don't have a movie. We have to go a little older, so we edged up. And then Ace of Field sends this phenomenal audition. He's highly intelligent. He's 
humble, as you can see, he's layered, whatever, he's a lovely guy, okay. And he's also just perfect for this role. He's on that cusp of boyhood, just about to become a man. He grew two inches during the shoot, made the wardrobe people crazy. He mostly shot in sequence so that he could, you know, develop his way through the show and grow through the show. And Asa and Hayden, I'm so glad I had you in the show. You both did great work. And they're delightful together as well. Just great, great, hardworking young people. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I mean, obviously, uh, Gigi, like you said, you've been, you know, dreaming of this movie for many, many years. You have an incredible cast. It's like a who's who of an Academy Awards and nominees. Um, was this the dream that you had all those years ago? Yeah, oh, I think it far exceeded the dream I had years ago. I mean, the reality is it's like something extraordinary. And I think the thing is, when you have material as good as this, it attracts <coughs> incredible talent on all sides of the camera. Um, the people that we had, the... the Gavin's mentioned our production designers, our stunt coordinators, all fans of the book, all people who wanted to see this film get made. Um, so yeah. People ask us, oh, what's, what's the process of uh, 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 deciding on uh, Sir Ben and Harrison Ford? And I say, you don't decide on them, they decide on you. <laughs> you know? And so the material and the fact that we didn't mess it up by saying the wrong thing or saying something dumb. Uh, it, it, it's far into my, it's an honor to be in your room with them. Um, let's move on to Sir, Sir Ben Kingsley then. Um, you have this incredible look in the film. I don't know how much we can talk about your character as such, because I don't want to give too much away. Are we safe in that guy? How well, are we safe in talking about Ben's character? Sir so Ben will handle whatever you ask him. <laughs> Great thing <laughs> I have no worry. I don't want to, I don't want to ruin the end. Um, let's talk about the, the, the facial tattoo that you have in this movie. That's stunning. Well, as Harrison pointed out, it is, it is a collaboration um, of the highest order, and one, one uh, layer or strata of actors are there to provoke the cadets and shape the cadets into what they have to be to serve our plan. And therefore, as well as, as, well as that being the, the fictional narrative, that's also the narrative that's going on on the film set. The harder I push Asa, and I have most of my scenes with my cadets with Asa, the harder he can push back. If I, if I moderate my performance, I'm underestimating his qualities as an actor. I have to treat him as an equal. As hard as I push, he will push back. And Harrison too, we both pushed him very hard and we got as good as we gave. And it was really exciting to see that. Um, my character, I would say, um, although there is ancestral philosophy in the tattoos, it's all the generations of warriors from the Maori tribes of New Zealand that he's descended from. And therefore, he is simply a hard-edged, pure fighting machine warrior, almost mythologized for his warriorhood. And I think part of the contribution that Harrison and I brought to the, to the younger performances is our estranged lack of tenderness. That was quite difficult for us. So that when you do witness the tender moments, they're very, very moving. Because we set the contrast against which the colors of tenderness can shine. So that when, when Haley's tender, when Abigail's tender as a sister, when, when Viola Davis is protective and tender as, a, as an adult observer, they're heightened by our job, which is you have to keep it distant, brittle, hard, and challenging. So that when there are, as they say, the moments of tenderness, the relief is, is really quite touching and moving. You earn that in the film by pulling back, so that when the tenderness comes forward, the audience are, well, they feel it. They really feel it in their hearts. So um, my... My role in the film is like a flying spear, just a simple, simple destructive machine. And I wish to pass on my warrior technique, my warrior lessons by testing, devising tests for the younger team and throwing these tests at them. Um, we have a question from Rachel Watson, again about the facial tattoos. How many hours of makeup are you in every day to get that look? Uh, I, it started off at two hours. And it went down to an hour and ten, but I used it. I went very, very still in makeup. I don't chatter in makeup. I go very quiet. 
I almost go zen, I gently run my lines in my head, I close my eyes, I let the guys do their work, I never look in the mirror, and then after that hour and a half, hour and ten, which goes very quickly, because I'm sort of under, I open my eyes, and there he is, and I leave the trailer and go on the set. Incredible. It's an Have you seen the look? It's absolutely stunning. It's something else, and it's an incredible performance. We need to talk about um, the training school. We need to talk about the zero gravity, um, because that is a standout, standout moment. The first time you go into that room, it is like something we've never seen cinematically before. Hey, so what was that training like? And Haley, for you as well, because I, I imagine that they didn't take you up in the vomit comic. Certainly not, no. <laughs> but um, that was so much fun. We had quite a few weeks before filming, practicing with the Australia crew, getting up in the wires, and just experiencing what it was like, and spending long periods of time up there just to get used to it. And then after that, we had an astronaut come in who showed us what it was really like to be in zero gravity. Because often it's stereotypes as being very slow and sluggish, but in reality, it really isn't. We were taught how your body would naturally when you're in zero gravity, and it was all really, really interesting. When we finally got up there in the suits, giving our lines, we really had such a blast. I mean, it was hard work, but we had a lot of fun doing it. How long were you in the harnesses, Hayley? Oh, Look at me. Long enough to wear Oh, man. Should I, should I rephrase that question? To how, how long did Gavin make you stay in that really uncomfortable harness, Hayley? Um, <laughs> um, not, I mean, well, long enough to where we would get to the point that we were just, we would look at each other and just laugh at anything that came out of our, out of our mouths. Um, and also to the point where we figured out that we look really funny upside down. Um, long enough to figure out stuff like that. Yeah. Can I say how politic you guys were? I mean, there's a beautiful scene where Haley takes Inda into the battle room night and what I sort of thought of as the walk, walk by the lake, you know, you go out in the moonlight with the lovely girl and it's, it's your first date, you know, and she's dating him really. I mean, she, 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 she asks him out, doesn't she? And then this moment um, where, where you, I love that moment, where you stand in the gate and you look out into this empty space and then you took, take his hand and, and it was so simple that they just had this thing in sync where one, two, and float. And the first time they did this was just in these harnesses and they're floating out into this green screen space, not nearly as romantic as I hope the scene feels now, because really into this ballroom. It's this green space. And the first time he did it, we ended up upside down. Oh my god, this is a disaster. I'm trying to keep my what happened to all that training? Anyway, second take, perfect. Out they go, back on balance. She swings him around into this. It's just beautiful stuff. So well then, do you, want to, do you want to say how many times you fell upside down and not really? In the training while I wasn't there? Oh, quite a few. Quite a few. What was the hardest part of those harnesses? What was that? Um, they were very uncomfortable. And underneath <laughs> our flash suits, they were even more uncomfortable. But in some ways, it really helps the way that you carry yourself. And the way that our wardrobe is structured, really, it's very impactful. And I think it has a lot to do with, again, how you carry yourself. and. And, um, it's kind of like a critical balance point, isn't there, yeah. when you're in these things? You, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, slight. You bend at the waist, and it's, it's hard to think about all the technical, you know, standpoints when, when there is a camera below you and a crew and, and, and stuff that actually needs to be done. But, um, but no, past all that, it's, it's a really beautiful and, and fun experience. We are coming, unfortunately, to the end of this, so I'm going to leave you with just one last question. They always say, stop it, Bob. Um, they don't always say stop it, Bob, but that's <laughs> jumped in with the question. Um, they always say that a, a, a director has one sci-fi movie in, within them because they are such incredible hard work, they're, they're tiring and testing. Um, what are the unique challenges of sci-fi? And also, a double-headed question, are we going to get a sequel? <laughs> Bob, you do the sequel. We always say it's bad luck to count your sequels before they hatch. Uh, <laughs> And in particular because we want to make sure that we, if anything like that, if we're lucky enough for anything like that to happen, that we want to know what all of you think about the work and want to get input about what was inspiring or what wasn't and make that part of the conversation, part of whatever any future development would be. So, though I have a title, no, I'm kidding. 
Uh, you know, we, we, we really, we just barely finished this movie. We want to make sure that this, this gets all the love and, and uh, respect that it deserves and not think about what should happen next. And for me, in terms of sci-fi, um, I think we've sort of all mentioned this in some ways. The time in which something takes place is a backdrop for a universe on time story. So, yes, Ender's Game is set in the future and it's set in these fabulous environments and I hope we've created it beautifully for you. Um, but at its heart, this is a timeless and universal story. I think Sir Ben was saying this could take place in ancient Greece, and it could place, take place 100 years in the future. Humanity is very interesting. We have evolved technologically, we have, you know, we're constantly evolving technologically, and yet something about us remains incredibly pure. It's why we can look back at stories from ancient Greece, we can look forward, because really we haven't evolved that much emotionally. We still have the same needs. We need love, we get jealous, we feel betrayed, we need nurturing, we get manipulated, and all of those beautiful human elements that are happening to you, me, and happen to these characters in the movie. And so for me, um, it's really about finding a great story, and the environment is hopefully something that's really cinematic, but it's the backdrop. I uh, had the pleasure of seeing the film today. It is nothing short of spectacular. It is a stunning movie. You guys are going to love it. It's out on the 25th of October. Make sure you go and see it. Please go absolutely crazy for my guest tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you.